How many people can say that I went and I drove a nuclear power submarine or I went to sea on a nuclear power submarine? Not very many people. Torpedo evasion. Being 20 some years old and being in charge of nuclear weapons, that's pretty impressive. What I really want is a sailor who has heart. He has pride in his ship. He wants to go out there and succeed in every task. I chose submarines because I love the fact that they're undetectable for the most part and uh, strike capabilities from out of nowhere. They range across the world's oceans in silence with a potent array of weapons at the ready. They are the U.S. Navy's submarine force. One of their weapons, the submarine-launched ballistic missile, helped America win the Cold War as a deterrent against Soviet aggression. Even now, U.S. Navy ballistic missile submarines continue their role to discourage those who might want to harm the United States. And there's another group of subs in today's force ready to meet the threat of an adversary with a variety of weapons from Tomahawk missiles to special forces. At the controls are a new generation of submariners who carry on a tradition of silent service beneath the sea. For much of the Cold War, the U.S. Navy ballistic missile submarine, known as the SSBN, was a rare sight on the ocean horizon. Where they went and when was shrouded in secrecy, as it is now and will be in the future. Since the 1960s, they've been tasked to cruise undetected through the world's oceans. Designed and built for one critical mission in an age of nuclear weapons, to help deter the threat of global nuclear war. Bridge, helm, maneuver and answers ahead one third, sir. Helm bridge, aye. Their crews call them boomers, and at 560 feet, the nuclear-powered USS Rhode Island is among the U.S. Navy's fleet ballistic missile subs on watch. From the outside world, they strive for stealth and surprise, while inside, the world of the Rhode Island hums with activity unique to the submariner. partially open with the breach door. Fourteen, away, repair, eleven, denote, twelve. The USS Rhode Island's nuclear deterrent punch is packed here along this corridor. Twenty-four massive tubes, each capable of housing a ballistic missile. It's here in vital spaces like these where life goes on for Rhode Island's crew of more than 100 submariners. Inside each rack, you have lift them up. You have storage, fate, storage space for your personal items in here. And also, you have a personal drawer for mostly toiletry items, a uh, gee dug. A submarine, you're, you're more close knit, so it's more of a family type setting. That's for her. Take station panel for uh, operations. Take station panel for operations. Yeah, and you can you can tell when a guy is actually having a bad day just from being around him on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, hey, this guy's having a bad day. You know what? I want to go talk to him and try to pick him up. You know, cruise mess is where the crew eats. Uh, crew comes down, sit down, and this is where we enjoy our meals. Right now, we have fruit set up because it's breakfast time. Uh, throughout the day, there's fruits snacks, cakes. The USS Rhode Island has a little bit of history for myself because this is where my career actually started. I started here as an E1 back in 1994. I checked on board July 15, 1994. Well, I have 16 and a half years in the Navy, three and a half left, and to finish my career where I started, it's kind of special to me. How many people can say that I went and I drove a nuclear power submarine or I went to sea on a nuclear power submarine? Not very many people. You have to be fit and selected to come to a submarine force. And that was the thing that attracted me the most is that the submarine force was different from everything else. Secure from general emergency. When junior guys come in, we train them that, hey, what we do is important. So we're supposed to remain submerged and undetected. So we instill that in them that, hey, being submerged and undetected counts a lot for what we do. As they go through their qualification process to earn their submarine qualifications, they learn more and more about you know, being submerged, undetected, and how, 
how much we depend on them as much as they depend on us to be able to save their lives. We depend on them to be able to save our lives at the same time. Mr. Ford Launchers, by them down, not out of two clears. My name's MT1 Joe Ament. Here we operate the system panel to actually operate it so we are able to launch a weapon. The, the switches here, we have to line them up to be able to launch the missile. Each tube is specific to allow us to open the hatch and pressurize the tube. I tried out college, didn't work. I had a little part-time job. I was like, hey, driving home one day, might as well check it out. Once I got to my first boat, they welcomed me and I don't know if I did something or the stars lined up and I, they accepted me for who I was and how I worked and I've been going full speed ever since. Uh, we uh, stand six hour watches. You're either on coming, off going or on watch and you just stand your six hour watches. Then when you're off going is when you have to do your maintenance, your clean up and all that and, and we actually uh, have an inspection in three weeks. So right now we're getting ready to hit it pretty hard. Set condition one is queued for training without guidance with launcher. This is the captain. This is an exercise. I'm Commander Bob Clark, um, USS Rhode Island uh, Blue Crew Commanding Officer. And I've been in this job for about two and a half years now. I've been in the Navy for uh, a little over 20 years, and uh, this is my fourth submarine tour. I kind of view our, my command as a football team. but difference between my team and uh, most professional football teams is I feel like my second stringers are as good as my first stringers. 6-8, shut the fence. 7-0. And that's because we conduct training continuously and we're putting those guys on in continuously into the game. Not many people work in an environment where you reposition one valve improperly and you can cause a major catastrophe. Fire team member, make the four part of the room ready, two one low, two one from launch. Make the four part of the room ready, two one low, two one from launch. Aye, sight glasses dry. So that meticulous attention to detail and really watching what you're doing at all times is vital in the submarine force. We, as a, an SSBN, are here to become the survivable asset for strategic deterrence, regardless of the uh, a rogue nation state or a or a terrorist group, they're going to think twice when they know that we have a Trident-class submarine out in a location unknown to them, with the amount of firepower that is on board the vessel. We're the big gun. Preparing for post-Cold War threats also has the U.S. Navy outfitting some of its Trident ballistic missile subs for a different kind of fight, equipping them to carry Tomahawk missiles and to support special operations. And there's another breed of U.S. subs built for stealth, to get close to an enemy near land or at sea and strike. All of them are designed so that they can perform several different missions. Obviously, with the uh, 688 being the, the oldest of the three, still a very, very capable submarine and is out there collecting intelligence, conducting surveillance and reconnaissance, still has insertion cap soft insertion capability, can do search and rescue missions, can do mine warfare missions, plus they can complement their insertion capability with the strike capability at the same time that they're putting the special forces ashore. And in some cases, the Virginia adds future design improvements as well because it was designed with modularity so that we can add on into the future. The modern day other world submarines are getting quieter and quieter uh, every day. What that means for us is we've got to improve our sensor systems that we hold on board, and we've got to improve the quieting on board uh, our own ships. Every time we go in to refit, we are conducting modernization improvements on, on the USS Rhode Island and the rest of the Trident fleet. The concept of deterrence hasn't changed. It's that unknown, the unknown of there may be a ballistic missile submarine out there waiting 
waiting in the wings is what keeps a lot of countries from doing things to the U.S. is because they don't know there's that sub, there's that fast attack submarine or there's that ballistic missile submarine out there and they just don't know, can't find us. We remain submerged undetected. Overall, it's still the crew is driving the submarine. The, the better your crew is, the better the boat's going to be. Submariners aboard USS Rhode Island are all too aware of their continuing mission of deterrence. They sit at the controls, knowing they could help to launch one of the most powerful weapons in the world, a missile loaded with nuclear warheads. 11, away, prepare, 22, denote, 16. Prepare at 16. I don't really look at it as a weapon that we're actually going to use be due to us being a strategic deterrent. I'm getting ready to leave my 20s, but being 20-something years old and being in charge of nuclear weapons, that's pretty impressive. I just try to look at it as just my job and do the right thing. We have a lot of rules and regulations imposed to prevent us from making any, any accidents or anything like that. Theirs is a revised version of the original intent behind the U.S. ballistic missile sub. Today's boomer stands ready to deter any number of potential adversaries. In the Cold War, there was one primary threat, the Soviet Union, and the mission to deter the Soviets from attacking the free world with nuclear weapons. The development of two antagonistic power blocks, led on the one side by the Soviet Union and on the other by the United States, resulted in what would soon be known as the Cold War. The Soviets built a very large submarine force after World War II. By the mid-1960s and throughout the 1970s, it's over 300 submarines. And the U.S. Navy has to come up with a counter for that. They incorporate nuclear propulsion in the late 1950s. They developed their own ballistic missile submarine force in the 1960s. That force of 300 submarines is potentially devastating in case of a conflict with the United States. The key thing that the U.S. Navy has going for it is an evolving technological lead. So we make our submarines quieter during the, during the Cold War. Those boats get quieter as we go. But the crews and the captains that are leading those crews really make a tremendous difference. The Soviet Navy has a conscript, a conscript force. Officers and enlisted are drafted initially. But the Soviet Navy doesn't retain the petty officers and chief petty officers that really keep ships running in most navies around the world, then and now. You want somebody who can really turn to at a moment's notice and fix something. And that's what the U.S. Navy is actually very good at recruiting and putting into the submarine force during the Cold War. This is the captain. This is an exercise. As a skipper, my, I knew my job was to train my uh, XO and my officers to be able to move to that job. People say, you know, how could you go out for you know, 125 days submerged and, you know, fill your time. Well, believe me, you were training people uh, and everybody was learning a new job. And again, the Navy makes the decision consciously that you've got to have an all-nuclear trained officer corps. You want officers who know the nuclear Navy first. Then in 1955, you get the USS Nautilus, the, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine. The crew of the Nautilus impresses the world with America's technological superiority. That really is the turning point that sets the Navy on the course for creating a much more dynamic submarine force, a nuclear-powered and all-nuclear-powered submarine force. You can visit her up in Groton, Connecticut. She's still there as a museum. We get a lot of uh, former submariners. Well, it's good for us, too, because we, uh, we get to talk to those guys, and they always have cool stories, you know. A lot of the the comma stuff really hasn't changed. Some of it's gotten more refined, you know. The ship's control panel has evolved over, over the years. You know, we drive a little bit differently now. You know, overall, it's still the crew is driving the submarine. And, uh, you know, the, the better your crew is, the better the boat's going to be.
our endurance. It has been extended by leaps and bounds with the advent of nuclear power. But the idea of not being detected and being prepared is something that's been passed on through the generations of submariners. Mission on USS Rhode Island. First off, we we'll read a story of uh, one of our World War II submarines that I present the dolphins. A gust of heat scorched the paint on the submarine superstructure and blistered the hull of the rescue vessel. Had Pigeon delayed in her race to the submarine's rescue, both vessels might have perished in the Holocaust. We can't forget about all the fundamentals that our predecessors essentially established for us. During every dolphin ceremony, we revisit that time. Brave Little Pigeon was the first ship of the U.S. Navy to be awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. What I really want is a sailor who has heart. He has pride in his ship. He wants to go out there and succeed in every task. He cares about his job day in day out. That's the sailor that I want. Having demonstrated his reliability under stress and having my full confidence and trust, I hereby certify that he is qualified in submarines. Torpedo men in general work very hard together, work very close together, because it takes more than one person to tube load a weapon and protect the ship. Recirculate. Submariners at the controls of the USS Rhode Island guide a vessel launched in the 1990s with a blend of analog, mechanical, and electronic systems. That hands-on world has seen a few changes in the newest Virginia class of submarines. The USS New Mexico is one of those next-generation Virginia class attack subs. New Mexico crews are immersed in the latest generation of digital technology, a world of flat panel touchscreen displays. It's an advanced system that also requires an advanced level of training. And that training happens here in this simulator at the Naval Submarine School in Groton, Connecticut. All in two thirds. All in two thirds, pilot eye. Five. All in standard. All in standard, pilot eye. Five. Go pilot. So no longer detect air escape before my ballast tank lights. Go pilot eye. I'll say one two slope down. Go pilot. Go pilot. One four zero. The ship's control station that you see here is all exact replica one, two, from zero. a Virginia class submarine up to the point where we could take one of those screens and actually put it onto a submarine. One three zero. When you're sitting in that chair and I'm running the scenarios at you, it feels real. The, the adrenaline gets going, the, the excitement's going, you have all the same indications as, as if it were really happening. So with the exception of knowing that you're not on a submarine underway, you feel that it's real. Upper depth ray. Four main bass tank vents open. Four five, five zero. zero. You're pretty much in it together. It's like you, you share both the same responsibility and it doesn't feel like you're you're on an island to yourself so you back each other up. They're pretty much the same indications that you would have on those other ships, but this one you're able to change the screens back and forth. And uh, if something fails, you're not, uh, say for instance, if a screen fails, you, you always have three other screens to look at. Today, recommend cycle main ballast tank forward main ballast tank vents. Very well, go pilot, go pilot, cycle main ballast, forward main ballast tank vents. With a joystick, it's a, it's a finesse to it um, because you're, you're used to pushing and using your muscles and now all you do is you're moving your hands back and forth so it takes a little bit to uh, get that finesse. On stage, we're going two thirds. Very well, pilot. 400 feet, seven five, eight zero. And this is almost the same exact thing on the boat, so and with the movement of the cab and everything, it's, it gives that realistic feel. Pilot, emergency service ship. Emergency service ship, pilot eye. 500 feet. 
While the Naval Submarine School supports home-ported submarine crews looking to maintain skills, it's also the first step for sailors looking to be submariners. That includes sailors in its basic enlisted submarine school, along with basic and advanced school for officers. Because of the different skill levels and experience levels, both in the fleet returnee and the new accession into the submarine force, you're almost building their level of knowledge and their experience level from the ground up. We take an evolutionary approach and step by step and we build them up. I am a part of the Navy right now, but having no sea time experience you kind of feel a little separated, so I'm looking forward to kind of, you know, pulling my own weight and, and earning what it is that I've been given. I've toured a few submarines, and uh, whenever I become engineering officer of the watch, I'm going to be in charge of the reactor, so that's going to be <laughs> pretty hefty, so you have to know what you're talking about when it comes to that. Now, when we do PKP, we'll have a hydraulic rupture. From a hydraulic rupture to a bilge fire, so it's a good hydraulic There's so much to learn. Uh, the, the capabilities of our systems are so vast uh, that you're limited in the amount of instruction you can give. As much as we can, we try to put them during the training in real life scenarios so that they can, uh, they can continue to be proficient in the, in, in the way that they manipulate the system. As it moves, you need to walk with it, okay? Uh, David Huddleston, I work at NAV Sub School. I am a torpedo man chief. The sole purpose of a, of a submarine being invented was to take the fight there, you know, launch torpedoes. Torpedo men in general work very hard together, work very close together, because it takes more than one person to tube load a weapon and protect the ship. So. Right? Too many clear forwards, too many clear afts, too much pausing in the evolution, right? You got to remember to keep that in your mind. It's an easy evolution. Don't make it more difficult than it has to be. Safety is our most important element. You know, torpedo room, it's a pretty dangerous place. 25-inch holes in the torpedo room, explosives all over the place. All it takes is one problem, one accident, and that could be it for us. Warning, sure the after ship rabbit and personnel are clear of hoist area. And warning. And warning. Understand warning. Slow it down just a little bit, all right? We train to shoot torpedoes. We train to shoot missiles. That's what our job is. Stop bolts to the fire position now. All right, now check your indication on your Wilkie. That's a fire. Yo, all your stop bolts are right here. Load, lock, and then fire. I'm Petty Officer Blaine, second class, submarine qualified. Taking the stop bolts to the lock position. Stand clear. clear. Torpedo mates have just a long history. I wanted to be part of that history. They're, we're very proud. We know how to get the job done, and I like to consider myself that way, and I thought I would fit in perfectly. Excuse me, taking the strain on rammer number one, stand at first, stand clear. Taking strain on rammer number one, at first, stand clear. Stepping on board the first time is very scary. If you can ease some of that stress when they're stepping on board is a huge chunk of, of their process, of their transition. I always keep telling you over the last four weeks that we've been together, foresight is the most important thing for us to have. I could go back to the whole pride thing as a torpedo man. A submarine without torpedo men on it and torpedoes on it is just a pleasure craft. We won the Cold War. We had a known adversary. Today, we have many potential adversaries. Our biggest thing is to make sure that we maintain accountability for the strategic weapon system so we can support, you know, whenever a commander in chief calls on us to be able to support. The submarine is all volunteer crew. It was a great place to be. 
uh, you realize that uh, w what you were learning, people were dependent on you to pull your, your weight uh, and the missions, you know, you got done and you were satisfied that, you know, you really had done something important for the country. I've uh, served on seven submarines. I have sailed around the world, literally. On my last boat, I was able to uh, provide a tour to the equivalent Russian chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. At the academy from 84 to 88, we were taught the Russians, Cold War, and I never would have dreamt that 20 years later, I would be given a tour to a Russian senior official, military official, along with his delegation, touring my submarine. Who would have thought that we would have come that far? As the chief of the boat on USS Santa Fe, uh, we surfaced at the North Pole. To do that with those warriors and those great Americans that I got to do it with, that was the highlight. I'm actually uh, quite pleased that the submarine force is integrating women into the submarine service uh, because we need that intellectual power and diversity of thought. The female has already shown that she, in all levels of combat, in all levels of our Navy and the Department of Defense, is a, you know, contributed just as much as anybody. And so uh, when, the, when the females uh, become part of our submarine force and we get our first female sailors assigned to the submarine force, I think she's going to be embraced just like any member of the crew. Robots can't perform our jobs. Uh, robots can't make the judgment calls that we, that we have to make. Well, we get a little bit scared sometimes that eventually that the computer technology will take over our job, but I don't think they'll ever take the humans off submarines.